do go back on video. All right. Well, six o'clock. Perfect. Okay. Well, we're already recording, so you can start whenever you want. Uh, well, hopefully, all that wasn't recorded. Oh, of course, but I can cut it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Seven Song, and uh, tonight's class is going to be on uh, staph infections. And so, excuse me, I'm gonna be fiddly with my blinds. You'll have to excuse me because the sun's going in clouds and out of clouds. So I'm gonna shut this. Michelle, if you could just cut this first part off and I'll start again. Oh yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, that's gonna be a lot easier. Woo. All right. Sorry folks. Uh, hello again. My name is Seven Song. And tonight's class is going to be on staph infections. And so what I want to do is to cover a broad overview of what staph infections are and a medical viewpoint of staph infections. And then we'll talk about treatment. So what I wanna say initially is if, if you're already a medical person or just have lots of information or you're just knowledgeable about staph infections, probably the first 45 minutes uh, may not be that interesting to you. Uh, but even if you're only a little bit knowledgeable Knowing what staph infections are, how common they are, what causes them, how they get under the skin, all that might be helpful and you might want to stay on. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I'll be looking to my left a lot because that's where my notes are. Uh, so a quick introduction. My name is Seven Song. I'm a, I'm a Jew. I'm Jewish. I'm not, there's so many ways to say that. They all sound a little weird. Um, and I'm originally from Long Island, New York. My family is originally Russian, so I'm a Russian Jew. And um, I run a school called the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine. If you like my style of teaching, uh, you can look at my school, the Northeast School of Botanical Medicine, uh, which I've been running for about 30 years, and you would see that at sevensong.com. Um, a lot of something that I feel really uh, good to be a part of is the Ithaca Free Clinic, where I offer my services and medicines for free in an integrative free clinic and very integrative medical doctors, nurse practitioners, herbalists, Reiki practitioners. If you're interested in the Ithaca Free Clinic, uh, you can go online and type in IthacaHealth.org and find that. Um, I think those are most of the things I want to cover that I'm a part of. Uh, I just also want to say that I have a lot of handouts. And unfortunately, I don't have a handout on staph infections. I'm working on one. So, uh, but if you go to my website, sevensong with the number seven dot com, you can see quite a few different handouts that I have. Uh, a lot of them are on first aid, botany, and other aspects of plants, nature. Probably the thing that's most relevant is for about 30 years, I've been going to an event called the Rainbow Gathering. So, Without going into a lot of details, the Rainbow Gathering, so the reason I'm mentioning it is because I've been a primary first aid worker at the Rainbow Gathering for close to 25 years now. And why that's important is initially there used to be about 20,000, now there's about 3,500 people. But throughout all this time, it's a wilderness gathering that's off grid, it's free. And so a lot of people come, there's, it's not a music event, it's just a, it's kind of started as a strong hippie gathering kind of is, so it's changed somewhat in the seventies. And so the reason that's important, particularly for this class, is when you have many thousands of people gathering without proper access to sanitation, getting people getting cut regularly, you have a lot of staph infections. So for the past 25 years, I've treated hundreds of staph infections from minor to more major staph infections, never sepsis, which we'll discuss. Um, not, I'm not saying that herbs always work, they have not always worked, uh, but I have treated many people and I've got to observe when I find that herbal medicine works uh, stronger than other times. So a part of this class, the last part of this class, maybe half of it, will be on the treatments that I've been working on and that I've seen other people use uh, during this time. Uh, so it's been interesting. So one of the reasons why free matters in the Rainbow Gathering and in this conversation is because a lot of people who come to the Rainbow Gathering uh, come from uh, backgrounds with very little resources and very little finances. In other words, they, they were poor growing up, which means they didn't get a lot of medical care because of the American system of medical care. 
Uh, many of them are immune compromised. And so staph infections and other infections could get pretty virulent, pretty strong and spreading on their body. So working with a group of people that lack resources, uh, like so many different medical avenues, uh, you can see what might be, uh, somebody with those resources might recover from faster, not recover. And also just in the future, like, so if I see somebody with staph infection at a rainbow gathering, and I say, you know, you have a choice between drugs and herbs, they go drugs and they have insurance. Well, that's an easy option, but they don't have, uh, they don't have insurance or they don't have access or they're just like entirely out of the system. That's not really a possibility. So a lot of these protocols that I'll be talking about tonight are based on my personal experience working. Uh, they're not things that I've lifted from the internet. Of course, all the information about staff, uh, that's all well-known uh, medical information. Uh, I want to give it, you all a warning um, that I'll be posting some fairly graphic pictures. I didn't choose the most graphic pictures I have of staph infections but it's pretty hard to describe something without seeing something. So what I'm gonna do at points, I'm gonna say, I'm about to show a graphic picture. And then if you like, you can just move your head, close your, well, if you close your computer, you won't be able to hear me say the next thing, which is the, the picture is now gone, I've removed the picture. Um, so some of them are bloody, some of them have abscesses, some of them have, are holes in the body. Um, so it just depends on your sensitivity to these types of pictures. Um, so <laughs> I'm getting a note. I love graphic pictures. I, I don't mind them. It depends. I mean, it has to be something I'm interested in. It's just not arbitrary graphic pictures. Uh, the class goals for tonight are, I'd like everybody to have a good understanding of what Staphylococcus aureus is, what this infection that I'm talking about is, uh, when to treat it and when to seek, um, other more professional help or more experienced help. And then uh, practical treatments uh, about working with staph infections. So those are the basic goals. So on with the show. So what is staph? So staph is a abbreviation for a Staphylococcus aureus. Staph is a faculative gram positive bacteria. And so part of the trick about, so staph is a bacteria, gram-positive bacteria. So staph has a number of tricks up its sleeve in why it's so problematic and sometimes not problematic. And we'll cover some of these aspects to it. Uh, but the most important thing to know is that when tested, 25 to 30% of all human beings, I don't know if these studies are worldwide in what populations, but these are studies that you show, see in many different countries because staph is worldwide. So Staphylococcus aureus is found present on 25 to 30% of all human beings. It's mostly found on the skin as a natural part of our, uh, of our micro our uh, macro or microbiota on the skin, just like there's a biota in the stomach, there's a biota in the skin. And it's also found commonly in nasal passages. If you scrape the inside of a nasal passage and do a study, often you will find Staphylococcus aureus. The things is, there are many types of Staphylococcus aureus. And some of them seem to uh, be commensal on our bodies. Commensal means that they get something from us, food of some sort. Uh, we don't receive anything back from them, nor do they do us any harm. So that's a commensal relationship. So uh, Staphylococcus aureus is just really common. Like it, again, it's like one out of four people have it on them. Uh, why sometimes it's more virulent? There are a number of ideas about that. Uh, I will say that I think sometimes it's just uh, people's immunity. I mean, it's not really just me thinking this is common. Uh, immunity can change it, but just having large holes in your body for a while, like just getting a lot of cuts, the bacteria moves in there, a different strain, a different type, a different strain moves in there, and then it goes from being commensal to pathogenic, then in other words, causing an infection, which can get worse. Um, so, staph often lives on us in a commensal way, not harmful way, uh, but often it does become pathogenic. Uh, some of those pathogenic consequences are skin infections and abscesses. 
that is by far the most, that is what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation. Staph also gets into food in, inside the digestive tract and causes food poisoning. Uh, the thing that you might have heard about is not common anymore, but it had to do with tampons a while ago called toxic shock syndrome. That's a staph infection. So staph goes from minor infections to major infections. So things like folliculitis, which is when you have an infection at the base of your hair where it meets the skin, that's staph generally. Boils are staph infections that tend to not be infectious. So in other words, they're not passed on. Uh, impetigo is a form of rash that is caused by staph. So what you have is that staph is an opportunistic bacteria that lives on human bodies, lives on other animals too, lives on human bodies and shows different strains or maybe it just changes type, can go from commensal to pathogenic. How it gets from one person to the other is not well understood. Uh, but a lot of this is just understanding the background that this is a really common bacteria. It also could become deadly. It could become septic. So every once in a while, somebody will say that they have uh, staph, they, they have systemic staph infection. That's possible, that's deadly. So you don't have like an, you don't have a day where you have a systemic staph infection and then it goes away. By the time that staph has gone into your bone, into your bloodstream, it becomes virulent and deadly and only intravenous antibiotics hopefully uh, will help. Staph infections are very commonly community acquired and hospital acquired. So those are two places you get them. They can also be livestock acquired. Uh, but uh, hospitals have a high percentage of infections. Uh, that's what happens when, so hospitals have advantages, right? Some very educated people being in one place, looking at a lot of people. But the disadvantage is many sick people near, being near each other, right? And so you have, there are hospital acquired uh, staph infections. Sometimes they're MRSA, we'll cover MRSA in a minute. Uh, but also community acquired. One of the common community acquired kinds of staph infections are from contact sports. Uh, so of course you can imagine one of the most common is gonna be wrestling, uh, where you have two bodies basically rubbing against each other and a mat and all that friction and all that skin rubbing uh, could definitely lead to staph infections. That'd be a community acquired uh, staph infection. So there's numerous ways to get them. Uh, how they just show up at everybody though is less well known. So I hope you have a very basic understanding. I'm gonna cover that very quickly again. Staph is abbreviation for Staphylococcus aureus. There are numerous strains of Staphylococcus aureus. Um, they're found on about a fourth of all human beings, generally in our skin and in our sinus passages. It, for most of our lives, many of us will have them and they'll be commensal or opportunistic feeders on us showing no detrimental effects. Um, but sometimes different strains or the staph somehow becomes pathogenic and then causes diseases. Those diseases range from fairly minor and usually self-healing to things like boils, impetigo, um, folliculitis potentially, to more serious. Uh, and that would include things like toxic so shock syndrome, some kinds of food poisoning, and probably one of the strongest is, uh, is sepsis. Also, if you have cellulitis, which is an infection subsurface to the skin, uh, cellulitis is often, uh, the underlying organism is often staphylococcus. Uh, if it isn't, like so many infections, uh, if it's not that, it's probably one of, the, it's a form of streptococcus. So I put that in a very different way of saying that. Uh, the vast majority of time when you have a cut and pus comes out of it and it's not healing, that is a staph infection. It's just not a major staph infection. And so this is the problem with it. I think we separate, when I say some of you might have staph, which I say fairly regularly, people have, people get very nervous about it because, you know, to them, like staph is this like end game rather than this thing that's a part of boils. Um, but basically the most, if you have a cut on your skin and it's pussing out and you have an infection in there, most likely it's staph, staphylococcus aureus. If not, it's the kind of strep. Doesn't mean it won't heal on its own. It just depends on how bad it is and what form of staph it, that it is. Uh, so moving on, let me just talk a little bit about MRSA. MRSA stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So basically the methicillins, that category of antibiotics were commonly used for uh, Staphylococcus uh, infections because they worked. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's happening less and less. And so like you, I'm sure many of you have heard of 
the term antibiotic resistance, but some of the staph have become antibiotic resistant to methicillin and some of the other uh, antibiotics that are used. Um, that doesn't mean that herbs are gonna work. We'll talk a lot about herbs, um, but it's just, it's a consideration. So one of the problems with staph is that many forms of it are becoming what are called MRSA. Uh, MRSA basically uh, is usually a genetically diverse species or type of um, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, but it's hard to know where it comes from. <clears throat> uh, we see it pretty commonly in first aid stations. Uh, I should say right now, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna drink a little water. We rarely test. Where I'm working, if it looks like staph and it acts like staph, we treat it like staph. Since it's such a common infection, it's assumed to be staph. If, if it looks much worse, we send the person to a hospital or another place to be checked out more thoroughly. So in general though, when you see infections, like you see it, you'll get a, a boil or a pustule or a pimple and it opens and pus comes out and it looks staphy, that's probably just a minor case of staph. Sometimes people will come in and I can show you, I'll show you some photos later where clearly it's a more virulent, virulent means stronger, virulent strain of staph and then your approach has to be uh, stronger as well. I will say that we treat MRSA and it looks like herbs definitely work some of the time. <laughs> That's kind of a contradiction. it looks like definitely. I would say that herbs work with some people with MRSA and other forms of staph. Any of those more serious stuff, that is way out of my league. That's in a hospital. Most likely that person is getting intravenous antibiotics and a, a lot of attention on a regular basis. So, uh, that's just a very common question. People ask me if I treat MRSA and the answer is yes. I treat it regularly at first aid stations. Uh, we never have it tested to see, you can test to look to see if it's a genetic strain of MRSA. We don't do that. But in general, I work with doctors, I work with emergency room doctors and I just am trusting uh, their ability uh, to diagnose it. So what I wanna say is what I, a little bit of, why do I see so much uh, staff at the rainbow gathering? So I wanna just go over this because I think this will fit into other categories as well. So first it's outdoors. And so people are outdoors, cuts are easier. Uh, access to soap and water is not as easy as it might be in, in a more not outdoorsy and more, in, you know, more people with sinks, soap, water, those things. So just being outdoors all the time and especially people working hard, cutting down trees, making fires, building furniture, working the first aid station. It's just easy to cut yourself. And it's, it can be a while before you take care of it. So I think we're learning because of COVID. I think people are learning to be more careful and be about washing. I think that's a positive outcome of this. Of course, not very little that's positive, but I think people are becoming more self-aware uh, about the importance of staying clean. Um, there's often just a lot of people uh, there up to like in the past, up to 12 to 20,000 and people are just interacting physically with each other, hugging each other, playing sports with each other. Uh, I mean, it's no, when I said that, I'm like, I'm not sure what sports people are playing, but it's just physical contact there. And so you have this outdoors, uh, lack of sanitary facilities. Uh, and then maybe some people are immune compromised for whatever reasons, for, immunosuppressive drugs that they take or a lack of proper health care in their life uh, causing it. And so they're also, it's about a week long. And so with that time, there's just it. I've seen it other, I mean, I've gone to week, I've done music events that are just a weekend and people have staff there too. Uh, it's just, it's just not uncommon. So well, that's really it about uh, the rainbow gathering. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, a really important question and why not just take antibiotics? And so I wanna say one of the reasons, there are so, I mean, one of the main reasons for people to take antibiotics is they're not gonna do the herbs, right? And so it's more work, herbs. So this is, this is the beginning of this. So why or why not take herbs? So let me go through some of these in a little bit of an order. Um, so some reasons to take herbs um, is that herbs are available uh, in stores without appointments and without prescriptions. So you could just buy them. In fact, if you're an herbalist, you could gather them. 
So, or you don't have, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. People can just gather their own plants if they know how to gather plants. And some of the plants used like yarrow, is fairly common. Japanese barberry, if you're in the Catskills, that plant is just a crazy weed. So there are a number of plants that you can use for, depending on the severity of your staph infections to use. Treatments could be done at home. This is some positive reasons about using herbs. I think a lot of people, uh, I would include myself in this. I like the feeling of having a little bit of autonomy, of self-autonomy. I like to feel like I can treat some things by myself, go to the medical world when I need to, but for other things, have an assess of how to, having a feeling of how to assess myself and treat myself, frankly, just feels good. And being an herbalist, I'm often around in circles where people uh, like the sensation of helping themselves, their families, friends, et cetera. Some reasons that herbs are problematic. Uh, if you don't have them, they could be expensive. They could be more expensive than antibiotics because you might have to take them for a while. So herbs could be expensive. They could be very difficult to find, right? Just depends where you live. I mean, you could buy probably some of them online. I would question, there are some companies online that are good. Uh, and then there's other things that I would question the strength of the medicine that you're taking. So now you're taking, you're spending a lot of money on something that's clearly uh, not as strong. Frankly, less is known about the efficaciousness of herbal medicine and staph and so many things. So there's just a question. It's a good question. Like, why not take antibiotics? Why herbs? So I would say my experience is that herbs work. But if you don't have that experience, I think questioning it and trying to find information on the efficaciousness of herbs online or in books, pretty hard to find it. So the next. Um, herbs taste terrible in general, right? Compared to many other things, they, especially compared to watermelon. <laughs> it's watermelon season here, which is delicious. But so if people are not used to taking strong tasting things, because some of what I'm gonna be giving them is internal herbs as well as external herbs for their staff. And so if they're taking things like Japanese barberry or yarrow, those are very strong tasting herbs. And so that will limit people's ability to take them. Uh, my experience is that instead of an antibiotic where you might take it once or twice a day, the herbs you have to take about four or five times a day often to help with staph infections internally, apply them externally once or twice a day. So more time, it's just more work. It is more work to use herbs than antibiotics. Uh, and also like some of the preparations like soaks, compresses and poultices, they're messy. So let's do a comparison. So with medications, they're easy to take, right? The ointments that are given for staph uh, are not messy. They come out of the tube really nicely. Uh, the pills are just an easy pill to take and swallow it, so th that's advantageous. Uh, often, you, some of the medicines are stronger, and you can just apply them once and rewrap yourself, and so not as uh, often, not take it as regularly. The medicines are already prepared, right? Often, when I'm making a medicine, or you maybe are making it for medicine from Pennsylvania, uh, that you have to then buy stuff and put it in water and make your medicine, as opposed to it's already made. I'm not, none of these things I'm saying superficially or in any way judgmental. I just think that we, in order to help people, we have to really see where people are coming from and not assume that how we do things is the way that other people do things. And of course, working in a free clinic uh, with people who have been disenfranchised really has shown me this. But working at the Rainbow Gathering has as well. Um, so then some of the disadvantages from, for, uh, for antibiotics. Antibiotics are the drugs that are used for staph. Antibiotics, there's a number of them, external and internal antibiotics are used are the main ones. I'm not gonna go over them. Uh, I've used lots of them because I work with doctors who use them regularly. Um, so some of the disadvantages, uh, you need to see a doctor or a nurse practitioner. Uh, and sometimes you can see them for free, uh, but sometimes it's expensive to make an appointment and you have to make an appointment and you have to go somewhere to see them, right? As opposed to having a home first aid kit and then just treating yourself. Um, antibiotics into prescription. So that's just one more step to get your medication. Uh, it could be expensive. So depending on the kind of insurance you have and the state you live in, and of course, most people I'm reading where people are from, and most people seem to be from the US. In the US, medicine is not free. Like some people have uh, Medicare, if you have a certain age, some of you have Medicaid, depending on your financial status. Um, but if you just have insurance, these things could be expensive out of out-of-pocket costs, or they could be inexpensive depending on what your coverage is. So there's that. And of course, then there's antibiotic resistance. And so the more you use the antibiotic, 
uh, the less likely, uh, the more likely it is over the course of time uh, can affect you, can, you can develop resistance uh, to it. There's some questions about this because it depends on the strain of staphylococcus that you have. Uh, so I hope you're with me. Give me a shout out if you're still with me here, Niagara Falls people and everybody else. All right. So next, so remember the first 45 minutes is about staff and then we do the next event. Thank you, everybody. Uh, then the next part of it will be more about treatment. All right. Thanks, Gabriel. So the next is about patient education. Um, I find patient education is really important, uh, and especially with a contagious disease like staphylococcus, like staph. And so we'll talk about that. Um, so when people have staph, <laughs> all right, Michelle, we'll get to the gross pictures. Um, so when we're talking about uh, staph, you, it's important to let people know they have a contagious infection. And so if they are make physical contact with somebody, especially if that person has an opening on their skin, it could be a micro opening, like a place where you would have a lot of openings if you shave your body, right? If you're shaving your hair off your body, you can easily make micro lacerations. So we're not talking about big cuts that you've gotten with pruners in the past, which of course I'm not making up, uh, where you have this big opening. You can have minor, it's bacteria, right? Bacteria find a way into tiny cracks. So it's communicable, and it's important to let the person know it's communicable, meaning that you can spread it from person to person. So at the rainbow gathering, you just gotta let people know they can't hug anybody. They can't put their clothes on. They, I guess if they wrap themselves in plastic and just have their face, on, but don't do that. So there's lots of ways, and we are learning all the ways to be friendly with each other without touching each other. So I guess, weirdly, maybe another advantage of COVID, again, with mostly disadvantages, is that people are learning to, to avoid touching. And I guess in a situation like this with people who have staff, I just say, please don't touch anybody else, especially don't do things like going to sweat lodges or someplace where like you're dripping water. So this is a rainbow gathering thing, right? And, and other cultures do this, but my guess, much, uh, my guess would be much more appropriately. So being cautious. And so the other thing about telling people that they have a communicable disease on the skin is just letting them know they're, they're a good person anyway. Well, hopefully they are. Right, because I think when you say that, people get all hangdog and like, oh, I'm a bad person, I got staff. Staff is common, lots of people get it. You just have to understand that it's communicable, but you can be a good person, you can smile, you can be a friendly person, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You just can't, shouldn't come into physical contact with people, even if your staff infections are wrapped up, I would just be cautious while you have staff. Um, so next, staff infections versus spider bites. So this is so common, so common, it makes me need to drink some water. <clears throat> I don't know how many people, how many times I've had somebody come into a first aid station and say, I have spider bites, which is different than spider farts, right? Which is, uh, what is a spider burps? Anyway, I'm gonna move out of that and back to this. Um, but they don't, they have staph infections. So why does this happen? It happens because all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and you look at your arm or your leg or someplace in your body like, where did I get all these weird looking pimples that are raised and some of them are pussy. And so since there's an idea that spiders bite a lot at night, they can bite at night, but it's just if you have spiders around on your body at night, right? So people often think they're spider bites. Now, the advantage is they're coming in to get treatment, and, but it's, spider bites are venomous, right? So you have venom versus a bacterial pathogen. They're, how they affect your body is different. So there are some similarities that I would give for a spider bite and a staph infection, but here's what I'm really trying to say is, when people say they have spider bites, you should start to see if they actually have staph infections. One of the ways to know that is more bumps may show up around the initial area, right? Because that's not gonna happen with spider bites. But if you get a spider bite on your forearm and then three days later, you have like four of them, I guess it's possible that spiders are drawn to the initial bite spot, but they're not bees. They're not drawn to where another bee has stung you. They're probably not gonna happen. So if you have a bunch of spots show up, that's, a, that's an idea that you might have, um, that you might have a staph infection. So that's number one. The other thing is it doesn't heal, but spider bites also don't heal. But in general, 
Spider bites don't show pus as quickly as staph infections do. When you have a staph infection, you have a bacteria in your skin. The way that our body deals with these bacteria that are pathogenic, which means bad for your health, is that they send white blood cells in. Initially, you get a lot of what are called neutrophils. Your pus is basically mostly dead white blood cells, neutrophils coming out of you. So as soon as they recognize the infective organism, the staph, you have, uh, you have your cells, white blood cells come in, and you get quickly, you get pus. Now, spider bites do get infected at times. I've seen really badly infected spider bites. So you both have the venomation of the spider bite, and now you have a bacterial infection, and it can be staph. But I've only seen that a few times. Uh, once again, bringing it down to the basics, when people say they have spider bites and they haven't seen the spider and it has a pimple with a little white head on it, I would assume probably a staph infection, uh, unless you know otherwise. So this is very different, of course, than really venomous spiders like hobo spiders and black widow spiders, brown recluses. Um, so that's discussing that with people. Most people insist, by the way, that they're spider bites. It's one of these really kind of no-win situations uh, because you really, spider bites are also not contagious, right? If you rub your venomous forearm on somebody, I've never seen anybody get the venom that way. So, um, so more continuing patient education, uh, just letting them know how contagious it is, letting them know that if they don't treat it, it can get worse. Uh, that it should be treated depending on um, you know, like a boil if a boil bursts often it's just like it's painful it might get more infected but often it heals on its own but some staph infections especially MRSA types they could spread they can get worse worst case scenario is they get into your bones and blood and become septic uh, that doesn't happen that often but you surely don't want to get it that way but that's not going to happen to a minor skin infection um all right so now we're going to move on to some of the considerations and risks of staff. So um, some people are gonna be a little more predisposed to staph infections only because they're more predisposed to infections in general. So for instance, people who are taking uh, dr uh, drugs that suppress immunity, right? Immunosuppressive therapies, they're gonna be more prone to all kinds of infections. That's gonna include staph. Diabetes, uh, if an uncontrolled diabetes, but the diabetes people are more uh, prone to infections as well. And so again, more prone to staph. There's actually some kind of scary studies that show that people who have long-term diabetes are sometimes prone, I think, the term, I think it was three times more. So this is not something I'm very knowledgeable about towards septic uh, staph infections. So if you're a diabetic, just checking yourself regularly, especially your feet where a very common place where cuts will happen. You might have, your feet might be numb. You might not notice the cut. You might not even notice the cut is infected. So it's just important to be aware of your body. And it's important for everybody to be aware of their body. Um, one sign that they might have staph infections rather than some other more minor infection is just all the signs you see when people have colds and flus, right? Lethargy, fever, tiredness, lack of appetite. So somebody with a bad staph infection, what's happening is the immune system is releasing all those cytokines that happen during other kinds of infections. And you have this, you have this set of symptoms that are common with different diseases. I don't see it that often. The most common result I see from staph is lethargy, is tiredness. That seems beyond just the person treating themselves. But also I've seen people with staph infections that are full of vim and vigor and there's really no, there's no change of the normal homeostasis. It's really just a local wound. Um, people who use intravenous drugs for whatever reason, staph is really common. Uh, staph is common because of where needles have been put into the body. Um, and so it's not so much the needle, it's just having, tra having needle tracks in your body, having holes in your body, the same places staff can get in there too. So if anybody's an IV user, an intravenous uh, drug user for any reason at all, uh, it's just important to make sure that infections don't show up at the site. Uh, one or two things about herbs, believe it or not, we'll get to herbs, uh, is that avoid comfrey at, at all. Don't ever use comfrey with staph infections, just straightforward. Comfrey externally, which is what we're talking about, will cause superficial skin growth. 
and um, which means by superficial, I just mean the top layer of skin growth. The thing is that staph is an, can be an anaerobic, that's the whole facultative thing I mentioned previously, um, is that staph can do well in a full oxygen environment, this 21% oxygen environment, but they can also do well in a less oxygenated environment, as in underneath oil or underneath your skin, which is how staph causes cellulitis, because the staph bacteria is doing just fine, a few layers of tissue down. So that's part of, of staph. Um, cleanliness and sanitation, both on the care of part of the worker and then as, as a part of the practitioner are really important. You, as soon as you see any kind of cut on anybody, really if you're touching people, you should wear gloves. Uh, unless, you know, I guess sometimes I'm working, not in COVID season, but another time, and I'm just trying to test somebody's knee to see if it's sprained or something. Sometimes not there and just wash up. But any kind of cut, any, any fluid coming out of a person's body, gloves on every single time. Uh, so we have that. Um, sterilize all your equipment uh, before you use it on people. We'll, show, I'll, we'll talk about, I'm going to do some demonstrations uh, with some of the equipment that I use. Um, I sterilize it in iodine. So let's spend a moment on iodine. So I'm usually using povidone iodine. The brand name is Betadine, but I would never buy Betadine. <laughs> I think I have a bottle of it here that I'm going to show you because it's way expensive and all the povidone iodines are exactly the same. Right, so I think there's different forms of iodine, right? Iodine comes in many different forms, but basically if you're buying off the shelf povidone iodine, uh, that's a great thing to sterilize equipment in. And actually iodine itself has, can kill certain kinds of staff. Some strains of staff actually are susceptible uh, to iodine. I know some people who use it regularly, I haven't, so I don't have the experience, but iodine is cheap, readily available. Um, and so I haven't used iodine yet, but I do sterilize the equipment in iodine. And also, if I've accidentally touched uh, an infection on somebody, I wash my hands and I, I put iodine on my hands, leave it for a few seconds and wash it off. So what'll happen, I don't know, somebody comes in, I, I don't know, I touch their arm for some reason, and all of a sudden I realize, oh, they have a cut on it. And then I'll say, excuse me, and I'll go and put some iodine on it, put it all over my fingers, just now we've all learned to clean our hands much better rub it around, make sure it gets it everywhere, let it sit for a few seconds, wash it off. I don't want to do that so much because iodine is definitely irritating uh, to uh, tissue. So you have to evaluate whether the thing is uh, staph or not. So this now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show um, a number of pictures. I see there's a couple of questions. I only saw the last one. Uh, iodine is just stronger against uh, iodine is just stronger against staph than alcohol. So that's why iodine, not alcohol. Uh, iodine has a whole, it bursts like bacteria cells. Very interesting. Just, you can look up povidone or just iodine. Remember, there's lots of forms of iodine though. So what I'm gonna do now is the, probably the next, I don't know, five minutes or so, I'm gonna show photos. And I'm just gonna go through them. So instead of showing them occasionally, I'm just gonna show them all now because it's easier for me. Um, and so if I, if you just like go out of ear, if you go within earshot, but don't watch your computer screen, um, this might work. I'm going to also open up my blinds, see if the sun's not in my eyes. Ah, beautiful. Excuse me. I'm... All right. It's really, it's, we're finally getting some rain here. All right, so remember, I'm about to show some, some of them are fairly gruesome photos of staph infections. Uh, so I'll just shout out and say, oh yeah, I'll try to yell somehow and say, pictures are over. All right, Michelle, let's go for this. Let's see, I think I can do this. Uh, this is gonna take me a moment, sorry. M my computer is just not so great at sharing. That's too bad. I wonder, this, I wonder if that's about me. Uh, that's not it. I should be with you in a moment. <laughs> I'm still learning. Uh, we're not done yet, by the way. A lot of folks are asking questions. There's still a lot more to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some photos. Michelle, if you can just, or somebody can send them, uh, just let me know if you can see the photos. Um, they're not up yet. So let's start. So this... Michelle, do you see that? 
I uh, remember you're going to have to share your desktop and not uh, folder. Okay. Sorry, folks. I'm still learning. Michelle is my tech guru. Uh, so let's see what I do here. I get rid of this. Uh, then do I have to open the picture separately? Yeah, you're going to have to open that folder. I see that one. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I see an arm there or a leg. Is it got? So how about how about now? Do you see it? Yes. Okay. So what you're looking at there is an abscess. So many abscesses often have numerous pathogenic bacteria, meaning disease-causing bacteria underneath them. But this is a classic. Um, uh, it's as you can see, it's mostly you. You can see a couple of little scars behind them. I'm not sure if they're staff or not, where they came from. Um, but you have to lance that open. So we're gonna talk about lancing, but lancing is basically using, I use scalpels, so I use sterile scalpels because they're extremely sharp. Um, if you have lidocaine, you can numb the area first, but usually what I'll do is I'll let the person know that I'd like to lance it and they have an option of yes or no. And then I will use a scalpel and I will stick it far in and cut a little to the side. It does hurt, it hurts a lot, but frankly, once you do it, the pus drains out of it and it feels way better. And then we treat it as an open wound, an open staffy wound. So that's an abscess. Um, you can also use lancets. You can use a very sharp needle. But if, you, if you're not used to, um, if you're not used to uh, doing this, I wouldn't do it. If you, don't, if you do it kind of half butted, it's not so good. Like if you just kind of go in a little bit and don't do it, you're just hurting the person. So if you're gonna use, if you're gonna, Lance something when size a wound, make sure you know what you're doing, practice, train uh, as necessary. Uh, so let's see, so next, uh, we're gonna go. Uh, often I see them on people's butts. So this is basically a boil on a butt uh, that became a staph infection, but boils are staph infections. And so we treated this, it's actually starting to look good. It actually took about four or five days to get the infection down. It was really hard. It would, so you know where my where that glove is there, at one point uh, the infection it was red up to there, and so a few days later the redness has gone down. The hole is still there, uh, but after a few days we're able to get that down pretty good. By the way, Michelle, can you see that picture? Are you looking at somebody's butt? Can yes, I ask? you can see it. It's just um a smaller up in your top left screen. I don't know if you want to make that a little bit bigger, but I don't want to, um, so you can't find your folder later. Just yeah, I don't know if you can make it a little bigger. I don't know if I can. Here we go. Oh, no, it's just going to white out the outside. All right. So um, they're going to get a little bit grosser. So by the way, here is somebody. Here's one of my students lancing a wound. Notice two gloved hands. Um, this place to dispose of it. That person has a lot of staff. Uh, you know, and we just we open one or two, but also we wanted them to get antibiotics. We'll come to that later. Uh, so this. Uh, picture right here. Um, excuse me a second. This picture right here, that's the beginning of a small, of a young staph infection. <laughs> Very young. You can see right to the left of it. Uh, that's another staph infection that's starting to happen. Well, actually, it's already open. Excuse me. And then, but that's that white head that often people think spider bites, that is definitely pus and that's a staph infection. Um, and so you can treat it. Sometimes you, you know, I avoid trying to shave too much around somebody like with deep wounds, I'll shave to put a wound on. But if you shave the, all that hair, which is problematic, uh, every place you shave can get infected. So I don't shave around staph infections, but it does get trickier to work because the hair will get in the wound, the hair in a wound will prevent the wound from closing. So there's problems there. Um, this is a more, so this is somebody with MRSA. Uh, this person had, it's not just on this leg, it's on their other leg. Uh, they were very compliant. Uh, you can see it's very clean. They were really good at washing, uh, but we sent them for antibiotics after a few days. Actually, we had antibiotics that day. Um, you guys working with two medical doctors, uh, but that person has a staph infection. It's so hard to wash and clean and it just kept spreading. You worry this can get into more over their body, but both their legs are covered. So that's a case of MRSA. It's a pretty virulent form of staph, uh, but mostly superficial at this point. So not too bad that way. 
Um, this is sometimes, so this is maybe well, about an inch and a half in diameter. Uh, this is a pretty big, this is a pretty nasty staff wound. Uh, this person had staff, we opened it and drained it and it filled and we opened it and drained it. The discoloration is activated charcoal. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, but it, it's not dirt. Um, it took about a week and a quarter, about maybe about eight days to really start healing this. That tissue is granulation tissue in the inside. That tissue on the inside is positive tissue. That is their skin regrowing. That is, that is not infection. That is not pus. You would not clean that out. You want that there. That's the, it's a little bit deep in their body, but you want, you need tissue regrowth and that's granulation tissue is happening right there. Um, there's just a few more really. This is when you open them up. This one's a little pretty graphic. Uh, this is when you get this cascade of blood and pus coming out of this. The, by the way, this is the same. Uh, I don't know if you'll see both of them. Um, but this is the same at, from that same wound that was opened up. And this is, a, they just, there was a lot of pus. It was deeply abscessed. And that's pus and blood coming out. Um, and let's see. I think uh, that's about it. This is a kind of a, this is, this was on somebody, this is problematic. So this is somebody who was, didn't want to take care of themselves, like it was very resistant to any medical care. They're getting cellulitis or they're getting infected, all that red around there. And so that's an old staph wound that hasn't healed. Um, they live in Hawaii and it seems like that warm tropical, uh, that warm tropical weather could increase the virility of staph. I, it seems true. I actually haven't read statistics, but I work with people sometimes who come from Hawaii and woo, sometimes they're staph. I've heard that you get it more regularly if you come up against coral, which is easy to come up against because they have bacteria because they're living organisms and that infiltrate and get into your wounds. But this is an old staph wound that's really badly infected. I would have put, there's more than that on their body. I would have put them in antibiotics. I don't know how they're doing. They're very, uh, it was difficult. Uh, and so we'll end up, so this is just like what we'll talk about covering the staph wound. And that's what it looks like, just vet wrap. And so I'm gonna move out of this scene here. So that's it for photos. I hope that was acceptable. <laughs> I have more, I, the drippy one is my favorite. I think we can have a vote for uh, which, is, uh, which is people's favorite. Uh, Michelle, can you help me open this back up or do I need to do something? Which would you, what would you like to open? Never, never mind, I got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your help as well. That's Michelle Marlowe, who's been amazing uh, helping me out for months now. Uh, so thank you always, Michelle. You can always send presents to Michelle. She'll be back in Oklahoma in a few weeks. She loves chocolate. So I'll send you her address. <laughs> Maybe I probably won't. I said it's too, too many. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to show you some demonstrations before we talk about specific herbs uh, for treatment. So we have about 45 minutes left. I might go a little bit over, and this will be recorded if you don't have time. So first, I want to show you uh, how to make an activated charcoal. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Michelle is acknowledging her love of chocolate with many V's and O's. Uh, so treatment number, there are two major treatments for staph infections. One of them is herbs internal and external, and the other is activated charcoal. These are gonna be the two main things I'm gonna focus for the rest of the class, basically. Of course, I'm gonna go off subject numerous times as well. Excuse me. So, when I see a staph infection, the first thing we do is we clean it out. So that's number one. We clean it out with just soap and water. Uh, it's really nice if the water is a little bit warm, it just feels nicer. We either use gauze pads. I don't use sterile gauze pads. I'll use those packets that you open up and then you have a lot of gauze pads because it's just easy to wipe. Paper towels just break apart. So gauze is just easier to clean with. I want to say that we have a separate medical waste when we do this. We are dealing with infectious agents. And so we don't want some dog ripping open the garbage and having staph gauze pads all over the place that have been full of drippy gauze, drippy staph. So um, 
So first we evaluate, right? So that's the first thing you do. You have to evaluate to see if it's staff. So we're just going to say we're saying that it is staff. Next, patient's choice. Do you want to take antibiotics or do you want uh, to go herbal route and then give them reasons for both? So have the, the, you know, give patients autonomy. If they want, we sometimes have medications. Again, I work with medical doctors. And so we have antibiotics and actually we have, we often have a couple of different kinds of antibiotics that are specific for staph infections, um, both uh, internally and externally. So um, I have given uh, antibiotics, but only, only with like a knowledgeable person uh, with me there. So excuse me while I find my place here kind of going off. I spent all day like getting my notes in order because usually I have enough knowledge. What I don't have is linearness, like not at all. Uh, if it's staff, is it MRSA or is it kind of a, just a normal boil? If it's a boil kind of staff, it's just going to probably just make sure it doesn't get worse. Treat it. If it's MRSA, you have to worry about the ramifications of it spreading. And that person, of course, can be highly contagious as well. Um, so next, uh, where the gloves go on, I'll put my gloves on in a bit. Uh, I get a waste paper basket that's separate from medical waste. And uh, those are my precautions. I'm not, I, I don't usually wear a face mask. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is a little bit gross, but I have opened up. One time I, I opened up an abscess and it was on the inside of somebody's arm here and it was really swollen. So if they bend, it puts a lot of, you know, if you, have, you can open, open mosquitoes up doing that, a little bit weird. But uh, you could pop mosquitoes, what I meant. Uh, but it was here, and when we popped it, it burst like, like a volcano. There was three of us working on this person, and we all got staff splattered. So I do have goggles. I could have been warned them. But that's very unusual. Uh, that only happened once. It would have been great to have that on those guys that do slow motion photography to capture that, watch all of our faces going into shock. So anyway, normally I just wear gloves. Nothing else. With COVID, I mean, if I was talking to you all live, I would be wearing a mask. So that's right, Terry. That was yuck. That was like yuck times 10. But a good story. I survived. We all survived. And the person's uh, wound got much better. So you're going to clean the wound. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to clean that wound really well. Again, I use non-sterile gauze by those big things that come in those paper wrappers, not individual ones, because it's all about, you know, First aid is free for us. So trying to keep costs down. Hot water, soap, clean, clean, clean. Get those nice, get those uh, staph infections nicely clean. And, uh, and then to start proceeding to treatment. Usually you don't have to debrid them. Usually you don't have to, it's not like, it's not like uh, they have some kind of wound, they have extra skin in there. So you're not usually like, cut, you know, uh, taking off little pieces of extra skin in order for the wound to heal. Uh, I don't have that too much with staph infections. You're gonna continually uh, monitor and evaluate I usually look at them every day for at least a few days to see if they're getting better or worse and to retreat and to rewrap. Um, sometimes people have floating scabs when they have staph infections. And so a floating scab is basically, it's like a scab, if you've ever seen a scab, I'm just using my arm. And if you look at the scab, if you press on it, it doesn't, it's not from like a good scab is well attached on all sides of your skin. The floating scab is not that. And when you push on it, pus comes around all the outside. So I find it easier to treat if I remove that scab. And the way that we remove the scab is basically just really warm water. I mean, you could yank it off. It's not, it's not that well attached, but still it hurts. What you do is you get some cotton gauze and you put it in really warm water and a little bit of soap and just soak it. And then the scab usually comes off. And then you can wash it out better. You can get the pus out of there and start the healing process for that. Remember, all this time, the person has the option of going to a hospital or a doctor or medical center and just taking antibiotics, which is another choice. And some of these things they might not do. So it depends on what, what they want to do. Again, it's always important to offer patients autonomy in their choices with these things. So one more thing I want to say is when somebody has staff, I check more thoroughly around their body. Not usually they're close stay on, but I check their whole arms come in here. I do check their buttocks, they're common there, but really the legs and the arms and the buttocks, meaning the butt cheeks, uh, where I see common staff. Uh, if the person, you know, if I'm gonna look at somebody's butt, frankly, 
uh, depending on, I'm gonna see if, if maybe if they see more male or female or just ask them if they feel comfortable with me. And usually I'll have another person with me just so it, usually I have a female accompany me as a chaperone or it's just something to bring comfort to it. So there's a very long subject about increasing patient safety especially if they don't know me, right? I'm not their regular doctor. So I want people to feel safe. And of course, I can have somebody else to examine them uh, if they feel more comfortable, gender or sex or, or trans, whatever their comfortability is. Uh, usually we can provide somebody to uh, look at their body uh, you know, when they have, to, they have to take their clothes off to look for wounds, to look for staff. All right. So the two main herbs that uh, I, the two main categories I use are activated charcoal uh, and I use a, a number of different herbs that I'll cover in a bit. So the activated charcoal, it just pulls the endotoxins or the, the waste product because like most bacteria, staph also create products and these products cause inflammation and harm to the local tissue. So if it's really surface, if it's really, you know that one that was really deep, excuse me, I wouldn't put activated charcoal in there. So that hole that was really deep, because if I put activated charcoal in there, it would stop any healing from progressing because the body's going to have to extrude out that activated charcoal, the powdered stuff. It's just not your body. Your body doesn't want stuff that's not your body in your body. So it's going to push that out and take longer to heal. But often if they're more surfacey, I'll use activated charcoal. And I'll use it as a poultice externally. I'm going to show you exactly how I do that in a minute. Um, so... Activated charcoal does one thing, but it does it really well and it does it really safe. And activated charcoal adsorbs the granule pieces, the, just imagine activated charcoal as sand. When you're on a beach, each piece of sand is an individual piece with activated charcoal. Each one of those is an individual granule. I'm not gonna go into a long discussion. I have lots of, I have lots of videos of me going way too much. Activated charcoal is a favorite medicine of mine. Um, but it's not a blood purifier. It doesn't do, I think, about two thirds of what people say it does. It adsorbs locally uh, many different proteins, including some of the endotoxins or bacterial waste products. So we're going to put on the person's body an activated charcoal poultice. And this is to adsorb as opposed to absorb. So I'm going to get some of these, some of the pieces to do this. I didn't have anybody's arm. So I have an alder twig to represent an arm. Alder, by the way, I haven't done it, but Kiva Rose, an herbalist in New Mexico, she uses alder a lot for staff. And I've been really interested in doing it. And so I cut down a, an alder to use as an arm and to use the bar and see if I can use it for staff. Activated charcoal. A container to mix it in. I think I don't ever have it is uh, measuring teaspoons. Anybody want to teeth on these? Um, gloves. Wet wrap. <laughs> it's a lot of things, isn't it? Scissors, gauze. We're ready. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move this stuff over. It's such a nice heavy piece of wood. Look at this color, by the way. Isn't that beautiful? Alder makes kind of a yellow orange tea. This is it, alder. Alder cerulata. So we're going to do a demonstration here. And give me a moment here. So I'm gonna mix the activated charcoal in this container at approximately two to one. Um, Tracy, I'm not sure what species of allness that uh, Kiva uses. I'm not sure. Because around here, like where you live, we have the same allness species, but I'm not sure what Kiva uses. But she got it from some books that she read. So I'm just going to use measuring spoons um, to, to do it more specifically. So basically, to cover a three by three gauze, of 
course, loves to match the ensemble. I love that word, ensemble. These do have latex. Uh, so I, I have non-latex gloves, but these have latex. I'm not specifically allergic to latex, but of course many people are. And latex gloves can start latex allergies. I think I ripped it. All right. So uh, we're going to put uh, two teaspoons. I really need two teaspoons. Actually, I'm going to put, I could probably go with one teaspoon of activated charcoal. I like to use a stainless steel bowl because they're easy to clean. This is to put on this, this uh, three by three pad. That's it for activated charcoal, not very much. And then I'm going to put a half a teaspoon of water in here. So one teaspoon of activated charcoal to a half a teaspoon of water. You don't have to be this exact. Then mix it up. It didn't come out as good as it did yesterday. Sorry, I'm gonna need a little more water. So I'm gonna, oh, that's weird. This half a teaspoon. Uh, I'm going to confess, yesterday I spent a long time measuring this out, and I thought it came out two to one, which should be this, but I'm going to have to add another, I'm going to add some more water. So I'm going to have to go off the cuff. I'm going to show you how much is in there. So I added about one teaspoon, added a half a teaspoon, and then I'm going to add a little bit. Here's really, here's the problem. If you add too much water, it gets just really watery and it's not so good. And that's the problem that I come into more often. So I'm going to add a little bit, a couple drops more of water. Might have been too much. And I'm going to mix it up. I don't usually use teaspoons to mix it up. And this is about right. So this is the consistency. I'm going to now put on the gauze, and you can see the consistency better there. So. This is, this is really, so I should, whatever that measurement, that's good. So a little bit clumps up, but a lot of it stays pretty watery. And I'm gonna just cover the middle section of this three by three gauze with this. I don't have to measure out again. Oh, darn. But I do like, I do like experiments. And this looks pretty good. So I don't know if you could see, it's just, it's not even a millimeter of thickness, really. Maybe one, one and a half, at most, millimeters thick. So this is, I'm gonna do the side view so you get maybe a better idea of the thickness. And this is about right. Activated charcoal is really messy stuff. And then what I'll do is I'll get my alder, and let's say the cut was here, right over there, I need a placement that's not a knot, right over here. And I'd put it on, I just put it on directly. We'll talk about doing a sandwich in a bit. Um, and then I'm going to take vet wrap. This part's important. So I'm not using tape to hold it in place, I'm using vet wrap or Medipour. Follow me on this, it'll take a minute. So then I'm gonna take the vet wrap and I'm gonna put it around, normally I don't get the not too tight, like tight enough to hold it in place, but you don't want to constrict blood from getting to the area and just make it uncomfortable. Cut it off. And vet wrap, which is also called Coflax, it has lots of names. Usually it holds in place, but sometimes I'll just take uh, some, I don't have it with me. Sometimes I'll take a piece of surgical tape and uh, hold it uh, to hold it in place, I'll take surgical tape and go on the outside of the vet wrap. Here's why that's important. Because, oh, by the way, when removing gloves, don't, ha don't have your hand touch your skin. So I, I did it too fast. So with this, even if, like this, I would have this touch, I would 
I would take it off. I would just have skid not touch skin. I have to do it again in a bit. Be careful how you take your gloves off. You can easily spread a disease if your gloved hand that did just touch the infection then touches your skin, you've now touched your skin with bacteria. So the reason to, that it's important to use VetRap or Medipore, which I'll discuss in a minute, is that VetRap, um, when you peel it off, it doesn't take hairs off and it doesn't leave glue. When you put a bandage on somebody, so I put a bandage on them and I hold it in place with tape. When I pull that tape out, hairs come out. When that hair comes out, you have now have an opening for bacterial infections to spread. And I've seen that, which is why I switched. So vet wrap holds it in place. You can hold the vet wrap in place with tape on the outside, but there's no glue touching the person's body, which makes that much easier. Let me show you what Medipore is. So that's my activated charcoal discussion. This stuff is expensive, but way, way worth it. So this is called Medipore. There's lots of different elastic wraps. It's a kind of surgical tape that's not very gluey. This one is a paper form, this plastic type. But when you put it on and hold it in place, uh, I could have got it at the tear mark and that would have been a bit easier. A little bit messy, sorry. <laughs> this is what you don't want to happen when you're doing one of these demonstrations, right? You know, just go, just go neatly and easily. That's not happening. So, so you, I'm gonna. Sh I do want to show the Medipore though. There is li There are perforated lines on it. So the Medipore. Just imagine I did this well. With the Medipore, if you put it on a person's body part, it's breathable. So it's tape that's breathable. It doesn't leave much glue and it follows movement. So remember that, remember that person's sore on their butt cheek? It's really hard to tape on the butt cheek. Like if you put tape around it, the butt cheek, I mean, I guess some people have totally firm butt cheeks, but most people are pretty movable. Also their thighs, people's thighs are movable. So if you put the gauze on and then put the vet, put the, excuse me, uh, the Medipore on, if it was on their arm, I would use vet wrap. If it was someplace like butt or thigh, I would use this to hold it in place. Also, you just can't tape around their whole, like if it's on their butt, you can't like tape around their whole body, right? Because you, then they, they, you know, they can't pee, they can't poop. So in those places and a few other places, this is great because when it comes off, it doesn't leave glue and it comes off easy. So this is called Medipore. It's by 3M, but there are definitely knockoffs that are pretty good that are much less expensive. We have lots of rolls of this in the first aid station. That and I bring a lot of vet wrap as well. So that's my demonstration of putting an activated charcoal poultice on. We also, I also often put herbs on as well. So in general, when I see somebody when I see somebody with um, a staph infection, and the first thing I want to do is give them herbs internally. We'll come to those herbs in a minute, but also I give them herbs externally. So while I have all this apparatus, I want to show you that. I needed to get another bowl. Everybody can sing yesterday, hum yesterday is elevator music as I get the next bowl. Just in the past year or two, I've just become in love with small stainless steel bowls. They're so cute, they're so usable. They're so good at portion control. So also, but I'm not gonna put the gloves on to do it this next one, just to make it easier. So the other thing that I do is often I put herbs on gauze and then I put the gauze on them. So it's gonna be very similar. So what I'll do is I'll get a, a gauze pad, everything has disappeared. So I'll get a gauze pad, three by three, four by four. Open it up. I do use sterile gauze uh, when I'm putting a bandage on somebody. I only use those non-sterile gauzes to clean the wounds. Put in a bowl and then get some of the herbs that I might use. 
They might include things like Oregon grapefruit. Um, that, that was not Oregon grapefruit. Chaparral. Sorry, I'm not sure the light is really bad for this. Oregon grapefruit and propolis. I'll cover these herbs a little bit more. Um, we're probably going to go a little bit late. It's 710. My guess is maybe, hopefully, we'll finish 740, 745. Um, sorry. I mean, it's really typical for me, frankly. And so what I'm just going to do is put a little bit of the herb. So normally, let me glove up. It just, it just feels like I'm doing it more. It's hard for me to waste equipment. Uh, I do have a lot of it. Downstairs, I just have, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, a big part of my house is just uh, relegated, regulated, spent towards uh, medicine. The one disadvantage of herbal medicine, um, the one disadvantage of herbal medicine is it takes up a lot of room and dried herbs, like really the disadvantage of being an herbalist, it takes up so much room, right? Like just a big portion of the home I live in is just herbs. It's bottles of tinctures and containers of herbs. So, I mean, there's some other medicines just look uh, lovely to me because they're so small that I'm a gross kind of guy. I like large amounts of stuff. So what we could just do is just pour some of the propolis, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, these are all tinctures, but they could all be liniments. Hi there. Uh, I'm going to sneak in. Uh, they can definitely be liniments, and we'll talk about liniments in a bit. So what I want to do is just show you how I do this, and then we'll do it. So basically, you just put it in here, pour a little bit of propolis tincture. You can see it's very non-exact numbers. Uh, put a little bit of Oregon grape root on here. Put a little bit of chaparral. These are herbs that I would really use. These are not just herbs I grabbed. These are herbs that I would use on a wound. So maybe I'm putting a mill of each, one milliliter, half a dropper full of each. And then same thing. So now I have this wound dressing. And I could put this then on and hold it in place. This time we can try the, the we'll just try the vet wrap again. This is what I use the most of. Vet wrap comes in a lot of really nice colors too. That part's nice. So then just hold it in place. It's pretty messy, very messy. And but hopefully you get the idea. If it was this messy, I probably would stop out. But since it's on a tree branch, I'm going to keep going. It's also a little tighter than I would want. It's actually hard to feel because I can ask somebody how it feels on there. And then cut that off. And now I have an alder covered in herbs and activated charcoal. And there we have a healed Alnus seriolata. It might be in Canna, actually. I think this is, I'm sorry, this is Alnus in Canna. Just a few other things to show you in place of all this. All right, so uh, to take off my gloves, don't touch it there. Uh, get it off in places where I'm just touching my glove to my glove. And then I can use this glove and go underneath here. Because, oh, so why am I using this glove now? I'm sorry. I, I've been really bad at explaining this. So now my glove is inside out. So the bacteria is in the inside here, not on the outside here. So when the glove is inside out, this portion of the glove should be safe and then remove this glove. Um, just a few more things in show and tell lab. This is the povidine iodine that I carry to sterilize equipment, to wash my hands with, and occasionally put on wounds. It's better than, I really, I wouldn't buy by the dime uh, because it's way more expensive. I'm not sure how I have this bottle. Once it went generic, people get it. I like, sometimes I have roll gauze. I have roll gauze so I can, if it's a bad wound, I can wrap it up and it just feels really nice to have gauze on top of the, on top of, you know, your three by three and then have roll gauze on top of that. The, one of the main times to use this is if they're bleeding a lot. Remember that one that had the drippiness coming out of it, the blood and pus? Uh, that bandage, I have pictures of it, but it, that, that bandage on it just got, you know, just got filled with pus and blood really quickly. So you have to change it, but at least after a while, if you put the roll gauze on it, this will absorb some of that as well. So it's not just getting quite as messy locally. And then vet wrap, hold this in place or tape. Sorry that I'm not answering questions. I'm just a terrible multitasker. 
Um, this is chaparral. I wish you can smell this because it's amazing. Uh, this is one of the plants that I use to soak wounds in uh, if they're infected. So I don't put this directly on, but I make a tea of the chaparral. This is Larea tridentata. And I soak it, I make a tea with it, and then the body person will soak their body part in the chaparral tea. So this is chaparral, Larea tridentata. It's one of the few bulk herbs I carry with me because it's very stable and it's one of the strongest antibacterial herbs. It is one of the strongest antibacterial herbs. Larea tridentata, chaparral or greasewood or gubernadora, uh, has many names. messy here by now. So I'll try to get to some of the questions later, uh, but for now I'm just going to stick uh, with the herbs. And what I want to do is talk about uh, some of the herbs that I use internally and some of the herbs I use externally. Again, I want to apologize. I see that there's a number of questions, um, but it's just, it will take too much time to answer them. And I just want to focus on this for now. So we've talked about evaluating the wound. We've talked about cleaning the wound. We've talked about taking off any floating scabs. We've talked about evaluating ourselves. Like, are, can we, uh, am I the person to be able to help with this problem? Does the per should the person take antibiotics? Do I think they should take antibiotics? Do they want to take antibiotics? So if we've gone like 10 steps to get here, now we're going to, again, we're going to clean that wound really well. Um, and we're going to give the person internal and external herbs at this point. A lot of them are similar and a few of them are different. So here we go with some of the herbs. First, let's go with preparations that I commonly use. So internally, the most common preparation that I give somebody is going to be a tincture. So the reason for that is tinctures are very stable and very concentrated. In a first aid kit, they're just easy to carry. I can carry like a lot of tinctures and have a lot of different herbs and not worry so much about heat or other environmental conditions uh, decreasing the effectiveness uh, of my tinctures. So that's reason number one. Uh, reason number two is the alcohol actually has a disinfectant action on itself. Oh, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about internal. I'll, I'll come to the disinfectant in a bit. So internally, uh, I can just carry a lot of different plants and I can carry large amounts of them. Uh, there's one very large negative problem with this, and I'm, I've said this every class, and I will say this every class. Before you give anybody, anybody that's not a young child, a tincture, you always let ask them the same question. And that question is, is alcohol acceptable? Don't say this is a tincture, is that acceptable? Say this has alcohol, because for the majority of people, the word tincture does not mean anything. It doesn't mean it's a plant and an ethanol base. So what you want to say is, this has alcohol, is that okay? And if you do, in a full day of working in a first aid station, I can tell you at least five people will say, no, definitely not. Usually because they're sober, but some uh, various religions, if they practice Islam, they're Muslim, or actually it could be any religion that doesn't, or, any, or their own spirituality that precludes the internal use of alcohol, uh, I want to feel, I want them, I just want to acknowledge that within them. So then I don't give it to them. The most common reason though people don't take alcohol is because they're sober. If they drink and they have bad drinking problem, you can give them the tinctures, it won't set them off. Don't put it in hot water. So I, I, I'm sorry, I always do this discussion, but I just worry about herbalists starting sober people drinking again. Because for people who drinking is a problem, it's the, probably one of their biggest problems in their life, way more than their staph infection. So again, very quickly, this is alcohol, is that okay? If they say, what do you mean by that? I go, well, the plants are based, I make them put alcohol in, they're like drinking alcohol. Most people are like, well, that sounds great. That's the most common response, like, oh, free alcohol. But other people say, no, I'm sober, or however they want to say it. Or it's against any kind of feeling, I just don't use alcohol in my body for whatever reason. Uh, then you have to move to glycerites. Most people that I know who don't drink alcohol will use it externally. And so that problem becomes less. 
So tinctures are the main way I give things internally. If not tinctures, the three other ways are gonna be tea, plant in a water base, glycerin, plants in a gl vegetable glycerin base, or capsules. So those are the three, again, tinctures, glycerins, capsules, and tea are the main ways that I get them in there, but tinctures by far the most. Externally, the most common preparation I'm gonna put on people are liniments. Liniments are plants that are based in isopropyl alcohol. So rubbing alcohol is isopropyl alcohol and water, depending on how strong your rubbing alcohol is. Unfortunately, because of people buying that for hand sanitation, uh, it's very difficult to get, but it will become available, it's easy to make. So I, I imagine at one point, uh, buy it, uh, wait till the prices come way down. I usually, because I make so many liniments, I buy isopropyl in five gallon containers. Um, so isopropyl alcohol uh, with herbs is called a liniment, and they're just cheaper to use in tinctures. For any external preparation that I say a liniment, you can use a tincture. For any external preparation, putting on a wound that I say tincture, you can use a liniment. The only reason to not use a tincture, which is in drinking alcohol, ethanol, is the price. The only reason. So because everything's for free, I'm always trying to figure out how to save money. And so liniments work well. Excuse me a second. Uh, liniments work well. Um, but they, uh, you can't drink them, right? So then you have to carry two medicines instead of one. So that's the only reason. I hope that made sense. Uh, externally, the other preparations I make are poultices. You saw me make a poultice with the charcoal. A poultice is when you take a plant and smush it and put it directly on the body, like the spit poultice. But much more commonly than poultices, I use compresses, which is where you take a plant and make a tea out of it, put a cloth in the tea, and put that on their body. So I make compresses for infections uh, somewhat regularly. And then sometimes we just soak it. So I'll have like, uh, I'll go to the dollar store and buy those um, two and a half gallon basins. This, this, buy this. I don't know how you can see that, by this, um, to soak their foot. But you know what works great if they have infections on their feet are bread pans. So probably don't bake bread with them right away. But some of us bring bread pans because they just, like even my, I have a size 12 foot, uh, they just fit right in there. Um, and so that's another way, because that way you don't have to make as much tea. I don't add tinctures or liniments into water that people's body parts are soaking into because it's too expensive. So you have to add a lot of tincture. That's why I carry chaparral because I have a big bag of it, which I've gathered because it's common where it grows. I make a lot of tea with chaparral and then the person can soak, make a really strong tea and then the person can soak it in really warm water. Warm is just good because the cell walls relax or the spaces between cells really relax a little bit with warm water so you get a better diffusion of the constituents into the body. All right. Um, so externally, liniments, um, I also do use oil sometimes. So like I'll put um, some strong herb in an oil base. I don't use too many oils though on staff because I'm always worried about the oil trapping in the bacteria. But I do have some in oils. But more so oils uncommon. I, I have it on here, probably shouldn't even be here. Probably should have put that oils all together. You could just catch me at this point saying, I don't really use oils for staph infections. Uh, soaks, the whole body part goes into it, and then you wash the basin out really well. Actually, sometimes what we do is we'll use those foot basins and we'll buy uh, disposable plastic bags. So the world of free uh, medical care is disposable, right? Most of my life, recycle, recycle, recycle. Not, you know, I don't recycle bandages, I don't recycle gloves. And, you know, everything that has infectious matter goes separately in a medical waste to someplace safer so people don't come in contact with it. So, um, so I want, of course, so what do we do is we have those bread pans and then we put plastic bags in the bread pans and then put the water in the plastic bag. So like a 10 gallon or eight and a half gallon plastic bag, uh, the bread pan goes into the plastic bag surrounds it. And that way it doesn't go in the bread pan itself. We still wash it out, but it just seems a little bit safer. And then we just throw that plastic bag out. That was my whole disposable thing. Uh, so now we come to the herbs. And that will be uh, for the rest of the class. I don't think I'm gonna have time to answer questions. I really, really don't have time to finish this. I'm really hoping that Michelle is okay for me going 15 minutes over. I promise another chocolate bar, Michelle, or something nice. I apologize. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle is just doing this. The, Michelle is helping all of you see this, and she's not charging me anything and being incredibly helpful. So I, I really, it's, that acknowledgments are important. Acknowledgments. What plants do I use regularly? Probably this whole time, like, shut up, seventh song. What plants do you use? Don't tell me the considerations. Don't go off on a tangent about the tangent that you're doing. That's about the tangent, about the tangent. But here we go. So these are some of the herbs that I commonly use. So the most common herb that I use internally and externally is going to be berberis or plants that are called things like Oregon grapefruit or barberry. Again, internally and externally. Remember, number two thing here, actually this one, is going to have that gauze pad is going to have Oregon grapefruit as one of the herbs on it. So any plant in the genus Berberis, these plants used to be in the genus, some of them in Mahonia, so Mahonia or Berberis around here. If you're from around where I'm from, or especially the Catskills, uh, Japanese barberry works great. You have lots of Japanese barberry, you use it up, you will never use it up, that plant will be there for until the next, next epoch. So, um, the dosage, when we talk about giving it internally, well, I'll just cover that in a little bit. Let me go over the specific herbs. So externally and internally, probably my favorite is going to be uh, Berberis. Uh, one of my next favorite, internal and external, again, is going to be uh, myrrh. So I've just become a very big fan of myrrh over the past couple of years. It's not easy to get high quality myrrh, but maybe medium quality works. So I tincture the myrrh and I liniment the myrrh, put in rubbing alcohol, same with the berberis. I have a tincture and I have a liniment, but I use myrrh internally uh, for staph infections. Remember people take antibiotics internally as well as externally. Uh, and so we're just doing the same thing. So I use myrrh a lot for these infections um, and I give it to them internally and I also put it on the poultices externally. So that's another one I use in both. Another herb that I use regularly uh, for this is propolis. I use it less internally and a lot externally. So propolis, which is a bee resin, I, it's one of my favorite things because basically anything that comes into contact with the propolis sticks. And so you get stickiness right up against that wound. So those herbs have a lot of contact time in order to help kill any bacteria. I do use propolis internally, but not so much for staph. I use propolis internally, a different subject entirely, mostly for uh, strep, not staph, but strep infections in the throat. Off of propolis, but I use it extensively externally. I am at a point in my life where I'm moving away from propolis and trying to use more pine resin uh, because basically propolis is just bees gathering resins off the buds. So instead of letting the bees do all the work and then taking the propolis, which is also expensive, uh, I'm starting to use more pine resins. Come back another year, and I'll let you know my experience. But basically I'm taking pine resins um, and then I'm putting them in alcohol and dissolving them and using them like propolis externally at this point. Uh, that's, so that's pine resins will happen. So I don't have a specific pine yet. Around here, most of our pines don't tend to leak a lot of resin. Some of the West Coast ones uh, drip resin easily or easier, uh, like especially like ponderosa pine. So what I've said so far are three herbs or four herbs that I use internally and externally. I use Oregon grapefruit and barberry, genus Berberis, internally and externally. I use myrrh, internally and externally, liniments and tinctures. I use propolis mainly uh, externally, but it's fine internally. I use pine resin, mostly externally. The next herb that I often use, I, could, I just combine these. Uh, I use a lot of yarrow. I use yarrow a lot internally and externally as an antibacterial herb. Uh, so I think a little bit weaker, but it's very common. You can just find it in not many places. And so now you have a plant that you have easy access to wherever you're going to an event, if there's some yarrow nearby. And it's a plant that grows around the Northern hemisphere of the world, right? So it doesn't grow everywhere, but it's a fairly common plant. So yarrow internally uh, as a tincture, externally as a liniment or a tincture. Uh, next, I use echinacea, again, uh, uh, internally and externally. Uh, so I'm just going to repeat all those, keep going with this. So, so far I've said I use yarrow internally and externally, Oregon grapefruit internally and externally, uh, myrrh internally and externally, echinacea internally and externally, propolis mainly external, pine resin mostly external. 
Um, and, and the last one I use just externally because of its flavor and that's chaparral. So that plant that my whole, you get, my room just stinks. Like my whole zone here is chaparral smell. Um, so Larea tridentata or chaparral is really an excellent antibacterial. I, I question its use internally. There's some, there's some people use it. It just feels strong in the body. I just, I have, without having any medical backup, I just tend to not use uh, chaparral much. And but frankly, the flavor is really hard to get down. But I use it extensively externally as a soak at a bath. Remember, person puts a foot in the tea. Um, but also I just put that tincture uh, directly on a gauze pad with other herbs and put that on there. So those are my anti-infective herbs. I hope you got them. Uh, the next major category uh, are going to be uh, herbs that are astringent. So astringent herbs help astringency. <laughs> I think I'm just giving, I'm one of those getting going faster and faster modes. Uh, the astringency of plants uh, also has an anti-inflammatory free radical scavenging aspect to most of them. You know how green tea gets all the accolades? So green tea, the medicinal part that they talk about are these tannins. Tannins are the things that call this, cause astringents, cause astringency or the tightening of cells closing next to each other. And so plants that have, have tannins are astringent. Again, the, what astringent things do is they pull proteins closer together. So if your cells are like this and, and you have a wound, you, get, you don't get skin growth, but you get cell adhesion or closer to each other, but not scarification. But also those tannins tend to be very good free radical scavengers. And when you add a free radical scavenger into a wound, you can decrease inflammation which often has a pro-radical aspect to it. So tannins help the skin mend and decrease inflammation by being uh, antioxidants or free radical scavengers. The same word said differently or the same idea said differently. So these plants are astringents. Uh, I use them all. I don't use store-bought witch hazel, but witch hazel is a common shrub where I live upstate New York. I'm from Ithaca, New York. And so I make my own medicine from witch hazel. I use the inner bark of the witch hazels, a mammalus virginiana uh, that I gather. I wouldn't, the store stuff is just alcohol. I mean, this doesn't have a smell or a taste of witch hazel. I never tasted it, but it doesn't have a smell. It smells like alcohol. So I would rather just make a really strong witch hazel product. Again, these are astringents. Uh, another really great astringent besides witch hazel is the oaks, but white oak is a little bit stronger. So white oak, Quercus alba, is another great astringent. I'm using these externally. The astringents that I've mentioned, I'm using externally. So we have white oak and we have witch hazel, hamamelis. The word hamamelis is such a good word by itself. So, and Hazel, if you're watching this, we know what we call you privately. So um, another really good uh, astringent are the roots of blackberries. Uh, raspberries are pretty good too. Uh, so if you tincture blackberry root, any species of blackberry, the genus Rubus, uh, you get pretty strong astringent. Not as quite as good as the other two, but pretty good. Frankly, I use the Rubus astringents, the blackberry root astringency more internally for diarrhea, which is a very different discussion. Um, and then one that's not that common, but I use sometimes because it's common enough around here is geranium root, geranium maculatum or spotted geranium the rhizome of that plant. But the main ones I use really are gonna be witch hazel and white oak. Those are my main astringent herbs that I tend to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Other herbs to consider are anti-inflammatories taken internally. Uh, sometimes reducing inflammation could increase the speed of your body uh, healing itself. I don't always use them, but if I see a lot of inflammation around it, uh, like swelling, I'll sometimes use anti-inflammatories internally. Some of the inter internal herbs that I use are licorice, Glyceriza glabra, and Glyceriza urolensis. Again, licorice, not pandas. I do, I do carry pandas with me in first aid. I really like, I really like chewing on licorice, uh, not Twizzlers. I like the panda candies uh, while working with breath freshener and just a bit of sweet. But the licorice root, the genus is Glyceriza. And the two species that are commonly used are glabra, European licorice, and urolensis, Chinese licorice. 
Um, I use almost any species of willow that's around. So almost anything in the genus Salex, I'll commonly use. These are internal agents that are anti-inflammatory. Sometimes reducing inflammation increases the speed of recovery. Uh, and then uh, one more that I like to use a lot is black birch. That's fairly common around here. You can use other birch species. Birch is in the genus Betula. I use black birch, which is Betula lenta, because it tastes like wintergreen and has a really nice anti-inflammatory action. So those are the main herbs uh, that I use. I will give pain herbs for people pretty regularly. So that could be anything valerian, hops, skullcap, um, you know, just your regular Jamaican dogwood, uh, pain relievers. So I'll say those again. So those, these are internal herbs because uh, it hurts. And so I'll give people valerian, valeriana officinalis, hops, humulus lupulus, skullcap, scutellaria species, Jamaican dogwood, Pisidia pisipula, um, and then there's others as well. So that takes us pretty much through the whole class. <laughs> not too bad, I'm just six minutes over. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, I wanna get off and I don't wanna keep Michelle too long and excuse myself as well. I hope that you found this useful. Uh, this will be then posted on uh, YouTube when Michelle gets around to it. Michelle is pretty busy doing a whole bunch of stuff in the East Coast. I hope you're enjoying the East Coast, Michelle, the Southeast. Um, if you like my style of teaching, I run a school. I don't know what's gonna happen next year. Right now I'm taking students, but I wanna be really clear. But uh, once again, thank you very much. My name is Seven Song. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And thank you everybody for your interest in herbal medicine. If you have questions, uh, once we post these on YouTube, you can go to YouTube and then write your questions in the comments section. We'll leave the comments section open for questions. I hope everybody has a really good night and I hope this was informative and thank you. Bye now, everybody.